Good morning. And howdy. First, I wanted to start off by saying thank you to Brother James for your prayer, Steve for leading us in the Lord's Supper, and Jim for the song service so far this morning. The invitation song today is Trust and Obey. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, trusting God and being obedient to him. The lesson comes from Genesis chapter 6 through 9, and we are familiar with it. It's Noah and the deluge, or the flood. Before we get too much farther into it, though, let's go ahead and see your notebooks. Awesome. So our three words for this morning are listen and trust and obey. Without listening, there can be no trust, and without trust, there can be no obedience. It is foundational that we first hear what God has to say to us. And this morning, we're going to go through and take lessons from the narrative of Noah and see how that applies to our lives today. It's a little sensitive. From Adam to Noah is roughly 1500 and, or 1,656 years, which is a pretty long time if you, come to, if you think about it, right? It's been just over 2,000 years since the time of Christ. But from the time of Noah or the time of Adam in the garden until we get to the point of Noah and the flood is between 1600 and 1700 years. And in this time, we see that man has done what God has instructed him to do in that he has multiplied and he has began to cover the face of the earth. But man has failed in that he has set his heart continually on wickedness. And those are the concepts and the verses that we open up chapter 6 with. As we get farther into chapter 6, we have this narrative of Noah. We understand that the world is full of wickedness. We see that God spoke to Noah, that he gave him instructions, both general and specific, to follow, that God made no, uh, promises to Noah about a covenant that would be made. We see that Noah, in response to listening obeyed and trusted. We see that Noah was ultimately delivered because of him listening, obeying, and trusting in God's power to deliver him. And ultimately, God gave Noah a sign. We're going to see this morning that as we go through the events of Noah, that these same principles apply to us today. So as we begin in Genesis chapter 6, I want to let you know that all the scriptures that we're going to talk about this morning are going to be on the overhead, but I would strongly encourage you to follow along in your Bibles because it's a wall of text. It is a lot of words on the screen, and I don't expect you to be able to, be able to follow through and read every word. So please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, follow along as we go, and then as we get into the latter half of our lesson, be sure to follow along there too, because that's where it's really going to matter the most to you. We can read the narrative of Noah all day, every day, and it doesn't change. And neither does the New Testament. But the way that we appreciate the way the scriptures apply to us changes every time that we get further into it. So please, open your Bibles, follow along. As we go through, beginning in verse 5, we see that the Lord looked down upon the face of the earth, and that man was wicked and the wickedness of man was great in the earth. It wasn't a small thing. Remember all the way back, just after the garden, Cain kills Abel. Murder. Murder is introduced to the face of the earth. And that's a pretty wicked thing to begin with. But as we go further along and centuries pass by, we see that man's heart is set continually on this wickedness. That the Lord God, the creator of all things. Remember back in the garden, and, and before the garden, excuse me, God said, it is good. 
He created these things, and at the end of each day, at the end of each creation, he said, it is good. Man is corrupted by Satan in the garden, and we see that focus of sin over the centuries. God looks down, and he sees that the world has become corrupted, and he regrets it. It says in the ESV translation that God is grieved, and grieve sounds a lot like the word grave, right? Well, it comes from that word. It comes from the word grave all the way back from the Latin, and it means to be wounded to the point of death. God is hurt. God is immensely hurt that his creation, which he speaks to, has turned its back to him and is instead focused on being sinful and wicked. And so God says, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. Moses records for us here that God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way. But right there in the middle of Genesis chapter 6, we find a reprieve. We find a remnant. And we're familiar with this concept of a remnant because God continually finds his remnant throughout all of human history, and we see it throughout all of the Old Testament and even to today, that we are a remnant of God's chosen people. God sees that Noah is righteous and he's blameless in his generation. He's an upright man. Noah walked with God. That's not something that's said too often of, of humans. But Noah walked with God. Noah trusted God. He knew who God was. He knew what God expected of him. And he listened and he obeyed. And the world was full of wickedness. And so God gave Noah instructions. God spoke to him. And he said to Noah, I want you to make an ark. That's a general instruction. What tools was he supposed to use? What scaffolding methods was he supposed to use? It was up to him. He had a task to complete, though, and a task that needed to be completed to specific commands. Make the cubit, or make the ark 300 cubits long. Make it 50 cubits wide. Make it 30 cubits tall. These are all the very specific commands. Cover it inside and outside with pitch. Set the door in the side. These are all very specific commands on how to do something that God wanted him to do. And it's important to take away from this point in Scripture that God tells us generally and specifically exactly how he wants us to obey him. And it's not for us to argue on what we think is better. God, don't you think it would be wise to put two doors in so that way they can come in one side and if we don't have enough space, we can shuffle them out the other side without blocking everything up? God, don't you think it would be smart if um, we, ended, we, we put this nice little canopy over here instead and, and had a little bit of shade while we're working or, or add this feature in here and you know, have a little trebuchet on the top or something absurd? That's what the movies would have to think, though. But that's not what happens here. Noah listens to God's instructions, and he follows them, because he knows that God is the deliverer, and what God has told Noah is the flood is coming. God also specifically tells Noah to gather animals in a specific number of both genders, and he also tells them to take every sort of food, every sort of food that's eaten, he doesn't tell him how to store it in the ark, though. That's a general command that Noah had the power to figure out what was best in that circumstance. So we see a mixture of specific and general commands here, and it's important, to, again, to take away <clears throat> that God gives that to us as well. And it's not for us to argue with him on how he wants things done. As we move along, we see early on in Genesis 6, that God is going to make a covenant with Noah and his family. <clears throat> and it's not until Genesis 9 that we hear what that covenant is. And I know we're hopping around a little bit here, but do follow, it's okay. Behold, I will establish my covenant with you, you and your offspring. And we're going to get a little bit farther here, but he essentially is telling Noah, after I deliver you, what is about to happen will never happen again. 
So we see three times in the Genesis narrative that Noah did all that he was commanded to do. He listened to God, he obeyed God, and he obeyed God because he trusted in God's power. He knew what God was telling him was the right course of action, and there was no questioning of it. And so ultimately Noah was delivered. God tells Noah in Genesis 7, go into the ark. Go into the ark, for I have seen that you are righteous in this generation. And God closes the door behind him, and he seals that door. <clears throat> and in Genesis chapter 8, we see that in the 601st year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, that the waters were finally dried from the earth. This is after 40 days of rain, and after seven and a half months of being in the ark, or seven months and ten days of being confined in the ark. In the junior high class that I just had the privilege of teaching, the lesson book talks about, can you imagine what it would be like to be trapped inside of something for seven months and ten days? And I told the junior high class, yes, we can, because we just did it for the last year, didn't we? We've been there. We understand what it would be like to be confined to something for such a stretch of period of time. And it's not easy. And I can tell you that Noah probably thought to himself, man, it would be a lot nicer if I could just get out of this. Hop up on deck and, and get in the sun for a little bit. But that wasn't the command of God. Go into the ark. Go into the ark. So finally we get through, and in Genesis 8 we see that God commands Noah again, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your son's wives and your sons, and bring out every living thing that is with you, all the, all the flesh, the birds and animals and every creeping thing, and let them multiply. Let them be fruitful and let them multiply on the face of the earth. If we recall back in early Genesis, this is the exact same thing that God had already commanded one time. Humans be fruitful and multiply. Animals, birds, creeping things, all after their own kind, be fruitful and multiply, cover the face of the earth. So Noah went out. Him and his sons and his sons' wives with them. Everything, everything that they brought into the ark with them, they went out. Noah was delivered. God had just destroyed all the flesh on the face of the earth. All living things on the face of the earth were destroyed. Right there. And Noah was delivered because he was righteous. He was upright. And God gave Noah a sign. He made a covenant with Noah, a covenant that still holds true to today, one that we can see the evidence of today, a wonderful promise that we hold to today. God says to Noah, I have set my bow in the cloud. This is a sign of the covenant that I've made with you. I've set my bow in the cloud. And we call this a rainbow. But in the passage, the word here is for the actual bow. It's a weapon of war. We see in Psalm chapter 7 that God is referred to as an archer. That when man doesn't repent, that God will wet his sword, that he will ready his bow, and that his righteous judgment will be upon the wicked man. But God here is saying, I've put my bow into the cloud. Never again will I destroy all of the face of the earth by water. It's not a promise, though, to withhold judgment for all of time. That's the takeaway. God is indeed saying, I will never again flood all of the face of the earth and destroy all flesh by water. But he is not saying, don't worry, though, there's never going to be judgment again. So this morning, I want us to spend some time taking a look at what we can learn from the narrative of Noah and how it applies to us today. I want us to take a look here because I believe that this OSH lesson that the children focused on this week is a very important and vital one. I believe, just as the Bible has taught us, that the old law was a school teacher given to us to prepare us for a coming better thing. 
And even now, there are still many great lessons that we can learn from what has been recorded for us in the Old Testament. We know that the world is still full of wickedness. We know that God has spoken to us and has given us instructions. We know that God has made us promises. We know we need to listen and trust and obey all that God has given to us. And we know that we will be delivered. And we know that God has given us a sign of this. So as we dig here, be sure to have your Bible ready. I uh, had Becca mark every passage in here. Every scripture that's on the board today will be overhead, but there will be a number of passages that we flip to as we talk this morning. And if I go a little too fast, I'm sorry. Uh, As Marilyn mentioned this morning, sometimes we need to take a step back and realize not to be so frenzied. And it's kind of hard once you get going to, to be able to do that. So let's talk about how the world is still full of wickedness today. <clears throat> I was looking up crime statistics for the entire world, and would you believe it? It's kind of hard to get all that information. In the United States, though, we would say that this is a good thing, and it, it, it indeed is, but unfortunately there's so many gaps in our reporting systems across the, the country that we can't be 100% sure. But the murder rate is down a little bit. Violent crimes against other humans in the country is down a lot. Property crimes are down a lot. But there seems to be just this surplusage of wickedness still. And it's not because, or excuse me, Crime being down is not an indicator of wickedness being down. Crime stats being down is simply either a lack of reporting, both on the individual side who's been harmed, but also from departments across the state and the country, reporting to the FBI, which then puts it into this larger report. There's a lack of communication, but it's not indicative of wickedness dropping. We see decriminalization of certain behaviors that God still says that's wrong. And it doesn't matter if we as humans think it's okay, God has called it wrong. We see this behavior over all the centuries. We look back at Corinth and we kind of equate it to modern day Las Vegas with just the sheer amount of sexual impurity and gambling and violence and wickedness that is in that city, but it's across the face of the earth. And I don't think any of us would contest that. There's not a spot in this place where you can go and say, there's no wickedness here. Because where there's a human, there is sinfulness. And while we abstain ourselves from continually sinning and continual wickedness, the vast majority of the human race does not. So let's consider 1 John chapter 2. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, it's from this world. Well, that's a great catch-all. What does that mean? What are the desires of the flesh? What are the desires of the eyes? What's the pride of life? Paul lists in nearly every letter that he writes and it's almost, it, it's really as if he had this ability to copy and paste it over, right? It's this long list of behaviors, immoral behaviors, sinful behaviors, and he tells us to avoid them, to abstain from them, to avoid those that practice them. He tells us, listen, this, this is the desire of the flesh, and the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I recorded for us here this morning, 2 Timothy 3, Verses 1 through 5, he's writing to Timothy, so under, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, they'll be proud and arrogant and abusive, they'll be disobedient to their parents, they'll be ungrateful, they'll be unholy, they'll be heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, they'll be without self-control, they'll be brutal, they'll not love good, they'll be treacherous and reckless, swollen with conceit, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. So when we look through and we see in 1 John that the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life all comes from the world, and we ask ourselves, what does that mean? We see that in the Bible. So y'all know I'm in law school, and as I've been taking classes and, and courses, Latin phrases come back to me. In pari materia means whole in all of it, in, in all of the material, and we have whole code and whole act. And, and here we have to be able to look at the Bible and say, what else is written? Where else can I find the answers that God has given me to find? It's right there in the Bible. So we look at 1 John and we see these three, these three categories of wickedness. And we say, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? And we can look at Romans 1. We can look at 1 Corinthians 5. We can look at Galatians 5 or Ephesians 4 and 5. We can look at Colossians chapter 3. We can even go back a letter and go into 1 Timothy chapter 1. And in all of these places and more, there are lists of wickedness that fit into these three categories. And I'll tell you now, equivocating and saying, well, I mean, I love some money, just enough for me to get by. Or I'm ambitious, not arrogant. I love helping other people, and I like it when they know that. What about being unappeasable? That there's never anything good enough for you. And it doesn't matter how small it is. We try to draw a line here and say, well, you know, it's okay because it's not as bad as murder. I didn't kill anybody today. Okay, that's cool. It's not the same, right? No, it is. It's still anything that comes between us and God, and it's on the flesh side, is a desire of the flesh, and it's wickedness. Anything that comes between us and God, and it causes our eyes to, to say, ooh, I like, I like that, I delight in that, is wickedness. And anything that places ourselves, our lives above the holiness of God is wickedness. The world is rampant. It's unfortunate, though. It's unfortunate because God has told us a number of times just how much he loves us and just what exactly he has done for us and to still see those who would desire to serve themselves is unfortunate. But the world is full of wickedness. And so, as we continue, we see that God has spoken to us. We know from Hebrews chapter 1 that in the beginning that God spoke to our fathers in different ways, through the prophets or directly, but today he speaks to us through his son, that it's through the word even now. God speaks to us. It is recorded for us here in the Bible, not by divine revelation and private interpretation of some angel delivering something to us today, as many in the world would seem to say. We have what God has spoken to us right there. So as we continue and we realize that God has spoken to us, we need, a, we need to read what it says. So Romans 13, beginning in verse 11, says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. Brethren, it is time for you to be alert. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and in sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. God has given us an instruction. He has told us something to do. There is wickedness in the world. And if you want to be delivered from it, here's what you're going to do. You're going to put on the armor of God, the armor of light. Okay, well, what's the armor of light, right? We turn over to Ephesians 6, and we see the whole armor of God, and it's a wonderful passage. And we read through that, and we realize God has equipped us 
for every good thing. And he has given us this imagery to help us realize just what exactly it means to be equipped for every good thing. The truth here is that Christ is returning. He is. God is not slack concerning his promises. He is long-suffering that all may come to repentance. And Christ's return is going to be like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to happen, but it will happen. We have another instruction, Philippians chapter 4. It's not enough to withhold ourselves and restrain ourselves from fleshly desires. It's not enough to abstain from entering into physical temptations. We must also purify our minds. We know this verse. It was our um, last year's theme, I believe. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. It's not enough to simply say, well, I am physically pure if you think evil thoughts, if you hate your brother, if you lust after another person. It is not enough to say, I haven't physically engaged in that behavior if you desire that behavior in your heart and mind. God gives us instruction, and here it's take care of your body, take care of your mind. And we see in 2 Peter chapter 1, for this very reason, and we'll get to what that very reason is later, but for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough just to say, I am clean physically. It's not enough just to say, okay, well, I don't think bad thoughts. And you know what? I do kind of think of those good things occasionally. Uh, I mean, my children are great and I, and I love, love thinking about them. So that has to be good enough, right? No, it's not. It's not enough to say, okay, I've done neutral acts. God doesn't want a neutral person. We see that in Revelation, right? Because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Being lukewarm is pretty filthy to God. And so God gives us instruction here. Add to your faith. Supplement your faith. Every addition here stems from our faith in God. Virtue, the Greek word here is eriton. It means uprightness. Knowledge, gnosin, which is doctrine or wisdom. Self-control. All right, now, this one's a hard one to pronounce, so you give me a second. Incratean. Self-mastery and self-restraint. Steadfastness. Hypomenon. Patient waiting with cheerful endurance. Godless, or godliness, esubian, devotion and piety, brotherly affection, this one's easy, Philadelphian, love of the brethren, and love, we know this one, agape, affection or benevolence. Noah was said to be upright, to be righteous and blameless, which implies he had knowledge of God and what God desired. He mastered himself. And he showed restraint by being obedient to God and building the ark. He was not distracted nor given cause to quit the purpose that God had given to him. He patiently waited too as he labored. And he worked while he waited. He worked and, and watched for God to fulfill his promise. He was devoted to God and his love for his family is apparent. And not just his love for his family, but his love for all mankind. I have no doubt that from the time of Adam through to the time of Noah, that they would have known the curse, curses, that came because of the actions of Adam and Eve in the garden. I have no doubt that Noah would have been aware of that and known that there was a seed coming 
that would deliver us from the wicked one. And so his obedience to God demonstrates his love for his family. His family were saved alongside him. And we see that his love for others is apparent as well. So as we continue on, we see the world is full of wickedness. God has spoken to us and has given us instructions. And God has made us some great promises. Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, which is what Derek read for us this morning, and I appreciate you, Derek, for doing so. The divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. God has made us some wonderful promises, some precious promises. Do you know what those are? Could you right now stand up and rattle off five promises that God has made you? Can you rattle off one promise that God has made you? Do we lose sight of the promises that God has made to us and instead get buried in the amount of work that we have to do or the concerns and the cares of the world that we have? Do we lose sight of these precious promises that God has made to us so that way we can be partakers of his divine nature? So that way we can escape the corruption of the world? Are you ready to basically machine gun fire some Bible verses with me? Let's begin in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, God and Jesus are recording for us a parable of the shepherd. We see that God and and Jesus is telling us that he is our shepherd. Beginning in verse 3, to him, who is that? He who enters by the door, to him, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. God has promised us to be our guide. He has promised to take care of us. He knows us. He knows us by name. That is a wonderful and precious gift. That is a wonderful and precious promise that God says, I know each and every one of you by name and you know my voice and you know that I will lead you and you can have faith in me. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, God promises to be faithful to us. Understand therefore that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. That's a precious promise. God is faithful. God promises us our salvation and eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Even in Romans 5, God promises us salvation. God tells us how sin entered the world through one man, and likewise how righteousness and salvation entered the world through one man. God tells us in Romans 5 how it was at an opportune time that God sent Jesus to die for the wicked, his enemies, those who are at war with him. John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. God has promised us salvation and eternal life. 
He has promised that he is going to make a place for us and he will bring us home one day. It says here, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. Sorry, in verse 2. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? I really, I read that verse and I feel like, why did Jesus have to say that? Wouldn't it have been enough for Jesus just to say, I go and prepare a place for you. There's, there's many rooms in my father's house. Sometimes I think we, uh, we get a little distracted, right? We've talked about that some this morning already. It's been 2,000 years since Christ's crucifixion. And the world would tell you, he ain't coming back because he's dead and he wasn't raised. And here you are looking for him and he's not going to be here. So I get why Jesus says it here. Listen, I wouldn't tell you this if it weren't so. I wouldn't tell you that I'm going to go prepare a place for you if I wasn't coming back to get you. Do you think Noah had a little bit of uncertainty? Okay, God, you've told me to build this ark. You've told me to get inside this thing. This is a massive structure. And then you're going to close the door behind me. What if God never opened the door? It says in in the Genesis narrative that, and God remembered Noah. Praise the Lord that he remembered Noah. But I don't think it means, oh, I was busy and I looked away and then I looked back at the earth and I saw, oh man, it's still covered in water. That's right, Noah. Oh, I remember him. I don't think it means that. God remembered Noah because Noah was righteous in God's eyes. He walked with God. God remembered Noah because Noah had a special place in God's mind, in my, in my opinion. He remembered him be, like we remember um, a fond memory. It's something that we look back to with gladness. Jesus is telling us, I am going to prepare a place for you. I have made this promise to you. You don't need to worry. I'm coming back to get you. It doesn't matter how much time is in between that. I'm coming back to get you. In James chapter 1, God promises to give us wisdom. And I've gotten these little sticky notes out of order, so give me just a second here. In James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. God has promised that if you seek his wisdom, if you seek to know his will, he will share that with you. And he does so right here in the word. God promises to grant us rest and peace and joy and love. We see that in Philippians chapter, uh, Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We turn over to Romans chapter 8. And beginning in verse 38. Let's back up to 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has made a promise of peace and joy and love to us. That in him will be our peace. That in him will be our joy. And that in him is our love. God has promised us riches in heaven. Turn over to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. 
For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We're not talking the latest uh, e-boy, Game Boy, Xbox, whatever. We're not promised a stack of guns and ammo in heaven. We're not promised these wonderful riches that we put, a, put it before ourselves here, right? Because, as we're told, riches in earth are stolen, they're destroyed, they decay. But the riches that we lay up in heaven, there is neither moth nor flame nor thief to harm. The riches we store up in heaven are great riches that will not be taken away from us. Turn over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That inheritance of eternal life is the ultimate treasure. God promises to adopt us into his family as well. Romans 8.15 for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. God promises to be our provision. Matthew 7, verse 11. Beginning in verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone, <clears throat> for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? God has promised to be our provision. Back over in Philippians chapter 4, in verse 19, God tells us, and my God, or Paul records for us rather, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But, Sean, there are starving people in the world. There are people without homes. I don't know if y'all are um, friends with some of the men that we support in Africa, if you're not, on, on Facebook that is, um, if you're not, I would encourage you to do so. It is humbling, humbling to see what Stephen and some of the others are going through. Just recently with the rain wiping out their crops and wondering, well, where's my bowl of rice going to come from? Can't just go down the street and get something because there is nothing. Stephen emails me, or rather he Facebook messages me sometimes, uh, and it's, it's really interesting to see just the difference between our life and their life. But the wonderful thing is, Stephen believes in the same promises that we do. And he knows that one day God will deliver him from all of this, just as we do. <clears throat> just because the wealth in one country is not the same as wealth in another country, and just because the wealth in one home is not the same as the wealth in another home does not mean that one is more righteous or more faithful to God than another. We're commanded to be content in all that we have. We're commanded to be wise in the way that we operate too. And we can't make excuses just because, or we can't blame God just because certain things fell one way or the other. Time and chance happen to all man. We can't let just earthly riches and treasures cause us to lose sight of the promises that God has given to us. Because the provision that God will provide for us, yes, part of that is earthly, I do believe, but it's not this gospel of wealth and prosperity that if I put my hand on a TV and I send my money off to some TV preacher that God's going to 
bless me a thousand fold with a yacht. That's not how it works. If it did, there would be a lot more yachts and a lot less space in the ocean because of all the yachts, right? Okay. Okay. Just the thought that came to my head. Anyway, God has also promised us renewal. Romans chapter 6 is a great uh, chapter to read. And we often go to it because there are many in the world who have no problem continuing in wickedness and sinfulness because at one point they accepted Jesus as their Savior in, in their heart. And that was the end of the matter. There was not any active obedience and faith that followed along with it. But we see in chapter 6 that if we have been united with him, this is verse 5, if we've been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. <coughs> but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> we are in a new life when we are baptized. We have put off the old man. We have put on the new man. And we are called in Romans chapter 12. There's a few pages over. In Romans chapter 12, an appeal is made to the brethren in Rome by Paul. And that applies to us today as well. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. <clears throat> God has promised us renewal, and he has told us how to be renewed. And another promise, and then we'll move on, but I, I, I tell you that this is not an exhaustive list. I am sure you can come up with more promises that God has given to us, but the last promise that we'll consider right here in this part of our lesson this morning is that God has promised to deliver us. And here I don't just mean into heaven, here I mean from sin. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God has promised us that when we find ourselves being tempted by whatever it is that tempts us, and, as, and let's face it, the temptations that we face change throughout our life. And as we master one area of our life, there always seems to be another area that flares up with temptation. <clears throat> God has told us, I will deliver a way out of that temptation. And he has. And he has kept that promise. And we find often that the reason we fall into temptation is because we don't look for that way out. We don't pray when the temptation arises. We don't turn to his word when the temptation arises. We don't seek the counsel and guidance of those who are stronger in faith than we are when the temptation arises. We do every little thing that we can do to find our way into the temptation. Oh no, I, I was tempted. And here I am, I fell to it. And it's, oh man, it's God's fault. And James tells us, let no one say that when he is tempted, that he has done so by God because God tempts no one. God is not evil. That is not in his repertoire. It is not in his power to do. When you are tempted and you fall into temptation, it's because of your own desires. And those desires that have bloomed and have led to sin. God has promised us deliverance in those times and in, in those trials. And while we may think that our situations are unique, there is not 
a sin or a temptation that overtakes man that is not common to all man. There is not decisions that you have to make that are any different fundamentally than a decision that somebody else has to make when it comes to restraining and not yielding to temptation. So let's look on and let's continue. With the idea, with the knowledge that the world is indeed full of wickedness still, and knowing that God has spoken to us and has given us instructions to follow both general and specific, and knowing that God has made promises to us, how should we react? Well, first and foremost, we need to listen, right? That's what Romans 10 says. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's a real easy lesson. That's a real easy verse that that most of us learn when we're children. You have to be faithful to God. And in order to be faithful to God, you have to hear what the word of God says. And once we listen... Ooh, that's small. All right, I didn't think it was going to be that small, y'all. I'm sorry. Once we listen and we see these promises that God has shared with us, and we see the wisdom that God has shared with us, we have to trust in God. Jesus says here, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you're going to wear, or what you're going to drink, excuse me, nor about your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and even, or excuse me, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. You need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. You need to trust God. And in the latter uh, part of that section, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God is already telling you, listen to me. Trust in me. I have given you great and precious promises. Obey me. And in 1 John, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever whoever has been born of him. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We must obey, brethren. We must obey in order to be delivered. Colossians chapter 1, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul continues to pray for the brethren at Colossae for a specific purpose, that they be pleasing to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord delivered them from the domain of darkness, just as he has promised to do to us today. And we have our own sign. We hold fast to the promise that God made to Noah with the rainbow, and we are reminded of that covenant that God will not destroy the whole face of the earth by water again. But we have our own sign here. (coughs) Pardon me. In 1 Peter 
chapter 3, it begins in verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to us God, bring us to God, excuse me, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. But God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subject to him. Brethren, baptism is our sign. It's an act of faith. It's an act of obedience. One that demonstrates that we believe in God's promises. We believe God is faithful to his promises. We believe that God is capable of accomplishing what he has promised. And so we do as has been instructed to us to do, not because we believe we can earn our salvation, but because we believe that God's grace saves us. When Noah completed the ark and he entered into it, God sealed the door behind him. This action on Noah's part was a visual sign of Noah's obedience to God. God closing the door behind Noah was separating Noah from the wickedness of the world that would perish through water. Baptism is our sign of trusting obedience. We are saved through those waters. Not that the water itself has any power, but that it separates us from the wicked. So as we draw this lesson to a close this morning, I want to ask you, are you ready to build your ark? Are you ready to look around you and see the wickedness that's in the world? Are you ready to cast aside sin and darkness and doubt? Are you ready to trust in God? Are you ready to hear what he has said? Are you ready to hear the promises that he has made you? Are you ready to be delivered? Philippians 2.12 tells us to work out our own salvation. But that's not to mean that we literally earn and work hard and gain our salvation and God owes it to us. No, work out our own salvation there is more like Ephesians 6 and verse 13. Having done all that is needed to stand against that evil day laboring and doing what is necessary right doing all that god calls upon us to do you build that ark and you will be delivered because god has promised to deliver you brethren i urge you if you are here today and you are in need of prayers if you're in need of the waters of baptism if you're in need at all that you let us know we'd be glad to pray for you The waters are ready. Brethren, if you're in any need, let us know together as we stand and sing.